Well, good evening, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Alyssa Ayers, and I'm Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs. And what a great evening to be able to welcome you all to in person. Very happy to be reconvening in person here uh, after three years for the David H. Miller Annual Lecture. We are going to have, I think, a very engaged discussion on African-led development tonight. I'd like to say just a few words about this memorial lecture, which is a special one for us. It's named for GW alumnus David H. Miller, who dedicated his career to US engagement in Africa. Following his untimely death in 2004, David's family, friends, and fellow alumni established the David H. Miller Endowment for African Studies at the Elliott School as a way to further his vision of US-Africa engagement and to strengthen the school's commitment to scholarship and programming on Africa in perpetuity. We are delighted to welcome members of David's family for tonight's event, Kyung Cho Miller and her children, Max and Audrey, as well as friends, I don't see Mark, Mark Brown and Tim Medina, uh, who created and have supported the endowment from its inception. So thank you so much for joining us again on campus for the first time, as I said, in three years. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors who have helped raise the visibility of this lecture among their organizations. First and foremost, the Elliott School's Institute for African Studies, along with four of our student groups, Young Black Professionals in International Affairs, the GW African Development Initiative, the Delta Phi Epsilon Professional Foreign Service Fraternity, and the Onero Institute. We appreciate your collaboration and we appreciate the student turnout tonight. I am now delighted to welcome our speakers for this evening. Let me first introduce Travis Atkins, who became the 10th president and CEO of the US African Development Foundation on January 18th of this year. Previously, he served as the deputy assistant administrator for Africa at USAID. As an international development leader, he has over two decades of experience working in governance, education, humanitarian affairs, and women's and youth empowerment, in over 50 nations throughout Africa and the Middle East. This includes service as staff director of the House Subcommittee on Africa, working with leading international NGOs and think tanks, as well as within several branches of the UN system. Mr. Adkins has served in numerous international election observation missions in Africa and the Middle East with the National Democratic Institute. He is a regular contributor to national and international media outlets on African affairs and is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. I can say that right after his appointment as president and CEO of the US African Development Foundation was announced, I said, we have to find an opportunity for him to address the Elliott School. And I am so glad that it worked out for this evening. We will be joined by Professor Jennifer Cook, who is director of the Elliott School's Institute for African Studies, which serves as a hub within the university to create opportunities for students, scholars, policymakers, and practitioners to learn, research, and share knowledge related to Africa within the university, African institutions, and the policymaking community. She teaches courses on US policy toward Africa and transnational security threats in Africa. Professor Cook joined the Elliott School in August 2018 after serving for 18 years as director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where she led research and analysis on political, economic, and security dynamics in Africa. Now let me now invite President Atkins to the podium to give some brief opening remarks. And following that, we will turn to a moderated discussion with Professor Cook. Thank you. Good evening. How's everyone? It's wonderful to see your beautiful faces. Uh, certainly my great honor uh, to be here with you. Uh, let me thank, of course, uh, Dean Ayers and the Elliott School, uh, Jennifer Cook and the Institute of African Studies, uh, and without doubt, uh, the family and the friends of, of David H. Miller, uh, who have done so much uh, to keep his legacy uh, alive. As I listened uh, to the note about his untimely passing um, in 2004, uh, I'm struck uh, by the idea of the fact that a person's impact uh, and in fact their nearest ones uh, would go so far uh, as to keep their work and, and their legacy uh, alive uh, in the world 
And I am one of those, uh, probably like many of you, uh, who have been touched by people uh, who we don't know, who perhaps we didn't meet, uh, but who lived their lives in a way uh, that was enviable, that was uh, worthy of imitation. Uh, and I find myself uh, to be one of those. Uh, I never got the chance to meet uh, Mr. Miller in his physical form, uh, but certainly I've known his work uh, and know the work now of the Corporate Council on Africa, uh, where many of my friends, uh, and colleagues and mentors uh, have served. Uh, and he is alive and well uh, in that way. So thank you guys um, for that honor. One thing I wanted to share quickly uh, is that every time I come before students uh, and young people <clears throat> and young professionals, I never let someone just read my bio uh, without putting it in context. Uh, because I think when you think of what a bio is, uh, simply a short synopsis of one's career achievements, uh, but sometimes I think they can read as if that person uh, was bound to be inevitably great and they went from strength to strength and success to success without no bumps uh, in the road. Uh, and I can tell you that that certainly is not the case uh, for me. And so I would just say quickly, um, as a poor uh, Black kid out of East Nashville, Tennessee, uh, I certainly did not see a path uh, to the life uh, that I lead now. There was no clear way uh, that I would end up uh, at George Washington University or at Georgetown University, don't throw stones at me, <laughs> or at USAID or the US African Development Foundation or the Council on Foreign Relations or any of these places. Uh, but I say that to say to you that whatever mountain uh, you find yourself climbing, know that many of those who came before you climbed similar mountains. Uh, I can remember being burdened by a student debt. I can remember the era of the unpaid internship when I was struggling to feed myself, washing my clothes and dishwashing liquid, going to the store at off hours of the evening and spending coins to buy my groceries. Uh, and I did all of that uh, because the only thing I had was this dream that I, uh, as one who loved Africa, as one who loved uh, the African diaspora, could live a life of service, uh, as we just talked about, uh, that Mr. Miller did. Uh, and that love really was all I had besides the community of people um, who were supporting me. Uh, and sometimes I had to fight them too, because they couldn't figure out why somebody would be working for free to do something that they couldn't see necessarily uh, the vision of. And so as I think about that, of course, that brings me to tonight's, tonight's discussion uh, of African-led development of the U.S. African Development Foundation, uh, what our mission uh, and mandate is, and how I, uh, as its 10th president, uh, intend to pursue uh, that mission. Uh, so I would just close by saying to you all, if you keep uh, the kind of service you want to do as your North Star, uh, then certainly you should be able to overcome the adversities uh, that you find uh, in your path. Uh, two observations. Um, as I round out my 100 days uh, as the president of USADF, uh, and those observations are about the two kinds of people that I have encountered in this first 100 days. One group absolutely loves the USADF, and another group has absolutely never heard of the US ADF. And of course, I make it my business uh, to expand that first group uh, and to diminish the second. And that's one of the reasons uh, that I'm here with you uh, this afternoon, besides the fact that I don't say no to Dean Ayers or Director Cook. Um, let me just get straight uh, to the heart uh, of the matter. And that is the mission uh, and the mandate of the US African Development Foundation, which is to support African communities across the continent who are the least served by existing markets or existing a sense of, excuse me, existing assistance programs so they can become part of Africa's growth story. So if 
I were to put that in one sentence, essentially we aim to serve the underserved of the underserved. And this is why Congress uh, created this organization, understanding that there were gaps uh, in coverage that other development assistance uh, agencies of the United States government could reach uh, and that they needed to have one that was swift and nimble uh, in some ways small, but yet also having a very immense impact um, in the field. And so that creation was about 40 years ago, just over 40 years ago now uh, in 1980. Uh, and part of the mandate for our operations is that we would invest directly into African entrepreneurs uh, and African enterprises without a middleman, right? And so one of the things that we have begun to hear over the course of the last few years, specifically in the wake of, of, of the murder of George Floyd was the notion in our field about decolonizing aid, about changing the way that we approach uh, the African continent, about seeing African people and governments as partners, right? And that conversation uh, had a veneer of, of newness and novelty to it. Uh, however, what most of those people didn't realize, uh, again, is that over 40 years ago, the US members of Congress uh, and the US government had a similar idea. Uh, and they created an organization to work in that way. Uh, and they decided to call it the US African Development Foundation. And so when I say we invest directly, that means that there are no overhead funds that are going to US NGOs, that we are not sending expatriates out uh, into the continent to tell people how they should do what they are told to do. Uh, our supposition is that these entities be African owned, that they be African led, and that we simply invest in the creativity and ingenuity that African people have already initiated for themselves, rather than imposing upon them programs uh, that they have not asked for. Uh, to that end, we also on the continent have 100% of our staff are African people. And so if you're in Senegal, the face of USADF Senegal is a Senegalese face. If you're in the DRC, it's a Congolese face. If you're in Ghana, it's a Ghanaian face. Uh, and so this is actually a plus in terms of how we want to do development differently, but it sometimes is an impediment because when people say they don't see USADF, they're looking for a big Prado or a big land cruiser with a flag on it. They're looking for big infrastructure. They're looking for expatriate faces. And what they don't realize is that they're actually passing by the face of USADF leadership on the sidewalks, in the, car, in the cafes and in the market uh, places, because that is the way that we choose uh, to operate. Of course, we also focus on 100% localized development, right? Driven by people in the communities in which they serve. And because those are African people and we don't have any patriots, we're not dealing with having to evacuate people when times get hard. We're not dealing with language challenges. We're dealing with people who are experts in the cultural context in which they work, in the regional context in which they work, in the political context in which they work. Uh, and also saying that we serve the underserved of the, of the underserved means that we have a focus uh, on women and on youth, on small, farm, small farmers, excuse me, and rural populations nomads and pastoralists, religious and ethnic minorities. Uh, and when we talk about women and youth, I, I've said this a few times since I've come on board, one of the things you find in Washington, because people want to have a specific emphasis on women and youth as we should, is that sometimes they end up being spoken of as if they are these small niche kind of special interest groups, when in fact, of course, they are the overwhelming majority on the population. Uh, and so I've uh, begun to call them a kind of marginalized majorities, right? Uh, but you can't work on the continent uh, with a focus on any group if you're not paying attention to them because what they don't have is a loss for everyone on the continent. And once they begin to grow and rise and elevate and cultivate their talents and contribute to their economies, uh, I think we will see uh, that 
that rising tide uh, would lift boats all across the African uh, continent. Uh, of course, now, over the last few years, we have been doing that work uh, in the context of COVID, in the context of climate change, not that's coming, but that is here, uh, in the context sometimes of conflict, in the context sometimes of coups. Uh, but again, because our staff are already home where they are, uh, we are able to keep going and we're able to reach populations that often are not able to be reached uh, by some of our counterparts. Uh, another thing that I should point out uh, that always was a nagging thing for me as I grew up in NGOs in the United States and government agencies and so forth uh, is our aim to live at home as we do uh, abroad. And so I should also say uh, another bragging point for us is that our staff uh, in Washington is over 60% uh, women. It is over 60% uh, people of color, many of whom are descendants of Africa or African first or second generation uh, immigrants. And so we do uh, seek to represent that at home and abroad. And so the question for me is how could an organization like this, uh, which should be in many ways the envy of the US interagency and the US foreign assistance and development space, how could it have been called the best kept secret uh, in the US government? And so again, my mission is to make sure that we just begin to consider it one of the best uh, and that it no longer is a secret. So I came to sit and be with you today uh, to talk uh, to Director Cook about our work, uh, about my aims, uh, and to hear from some of you about questions you may have as well. So I'll stop there and I'll look forward to our chat. This morning. Travis, uh, how uh, fantastic to see you and to know that you're at the helm of um, this really kind of original, in a way, um, nimble organization. Um, at, in my U.S. foreign policy class, in the, towards the beginning of the semester, we have a chart up of all the agencies um, that have to do with um, Africa policy. And this year, I said about the USADF, Watch that space, since Travis Adkins. We made the chart. We made the chart this year. <laughs> you wrote the work. You oh, we're already on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, um, uh, really, uh, already, you know, you've been raising the profile of the organization, um, getting people excited about it, telling the story um, as you're doing <clears> here today. And um, yeah, I think um, it's time. <laughs> uh, it's time is coming. I wondered maybe to start, uh, because you've talked about kind of the big picture of what um, the USATF does. If you could maybe paint a, paint a picture for us, like a story, um, you, you've just been traveling, I gather, yes. and maybe one of the examples and how that works and who are the partners and what it, what it looks like. Um, sure, think about. sure. So when we say partners, I mean, we're really talking about a wide range of folks. Sometimes we're talking about the U.S. interagency, MCC, DFC, USA, and so forth. Uh, on another level, we're talking about uh, corporations, you know, MasterCard, Stanford Bank, City, and so forth. Uh, the NBA, where we're working with the NBA Players uh, Association on programming uh, as well. But at the base level, when we talk about partners, uh, we're either talking about African governments at national or subnational levels, we're talking about um, our staff on the ground, uh, who essentially are our liaisons with the, the partner organizations in whom we invest. And so these could be farmers cooperatives. Uh, these could be vocational training institutions. Uh, these could be youth uh, programs where we're doing uh, vocational training with youth. Uh, and one of the things I like to say about that uh, is there are many agencies and organizations that do on vocational training, but ours is always, always, always coupled with businesses that are actually going to hire uh, these young people. And so there's one that comes to my mind right now where there's a business uh, that has decided uh, that they would hire up to 85% of the trainees coming out of the vocational training programs 
uh, that we are doing. And I will say, uh, Jennifer, just to give one quick example, uh, there is a group of farmers, it's called Loka Reese, Loka Reese, and local rice uh, in Cote d'Ivoire uh, that I just uh, came from a couple of weeks ago. And what we're doing for them is providing inputs for their farmers. Uh, and part of it is to help them to increase their yields. Uh, part of it is to help them uh, get their rice to market, uh, to begin to make it uh, the rice of choice uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, because many of these uh, entities that you would find in, in these countries, they often have been importing their rice. And so not only is the market set up for that, but people's taste and appetites and their childhood memories are, are all linked into the taste of a certain kind of rice. And so when you want to change that, um, it takes this kind of work. And one of the things that uh, the geopolitical piece uh, that comes from this, Jennifer, is that one of the reasons they decided to do this is in COVID, uh, because of all the challenges of transport, they started having difficulty and shortages of being able to transport their rice from China, actually. And so they decided we ought to do this um, ourselves. And so we went out uh, to visit them and to look at the rice paddies and their challenges with uh, excuse me, irrigation, uh, their challenges with pestilence and birds and so forth, uh, and all of the things that they need to do uh, to begin to be able to meet the supply or the demand that they're creating for this, this product. And so we find ourselves often in those positions. And sometimes it's much smaller outfits, people who are uh, the pheasant propagation or doing eggs or things with goats and milk and things of that of that nature. So there's a pretty wide range uh, of folks um, that we support, but all of whom have had their own ingenuity. Just thinking of a few others uh, in Senegal, there were people doing uh, kind of artisanal teas and things of that nature which they were bringing to market. Uh, one young woman who had been a graduate of Yali was doing beef jerky. Uh, and she had been able to take this from an idea in her backyard to being in stores all over uh, the country. Uh, another young man had created what was called uh, cashew apple juice. Uh, this was very intriguing because I had never heard of, of a cashew apple. Uh, but actually the cashew grows out of a thing that, that looks like an apple. And people take the cashew and cast away the apple. And he found in that um, the idea to not waste uh, this product, but to turn it into something uh, that is special and unique and niche uh, for Senegal. Uh, and he has been able uh, to do that. And so those are just a few of the examples of the kind of entrepreneurs uh, and partners we have in the countries uh, where we serve. Um, excellent. Great examples, too. Um, and I imagine um, with the impacts of Ukraine uh, on Africa, rising energy prices, rising food prices, um, that kind of thing is going to be ever more important. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, these kind of geopolitical things only exacerbate really pre-existing problems, right? And so the thing that I'm saying about the USADF is that somewhere in our interagency, we have to have an outfit that is primarily concerned with the prospects of success for everyday African people, regardless of coup, regardless of conflict, regardless of climate or COVID, still the everyday African mother has to be able to take care of her children. The everyday African father has to be able to take care of his children. Schools have to operate. People have to have appropriate nutrition uh, and the capacity uh, to create for themselves the lives uh, that they desire. And so that is why uh, about 70% of our funding uh, grant funding goes into the areas of agriculture and food security. That leads you into the resilience and that leads you into issues that are combating uh, the changes uh, in the climate, much less the larger geopolitical issues uh, related to the Ukraine uh, and, and other places. Uh, but our job is to try to make sure that African people uh, of the everyday variety can defend uh, their lives and their livelihoods by being able to have a strong economic foundation to support themselves. Um, <laughs> Um, well, I suppose I didn't ask. Um, 
I wonder, uh, how, uh, the needs are great. Um, I imagine, I mean, entrepreneurialism is everywhere in Africa. And I wonder how it is that you prioritize the countries that you're in, the regions in the countries, and even the, you know, the, the grant, I don't know if you call them grantees or partners on the ground. How, what's that process like? Sure, it's a very interesting process. I think, first of all, uh, historically, we have focused on really three regions uh, of the continent. That is the Sahel, uh, that is the Great Lakes, uh, that is the Horn of Africa. And if you think about those three regions from a 30,000 foot perspective, specifically the Sahel and the Horn, you're talking about the collision uh, of colonial legacies, uh, governance, uh, environmental challenges, dealing with arid, context and lack of rain, uh, but also a dearth of natural resources. Then if you take the Great Lakes and you put it to the side and you say, well, it has some of the same issues of weak governance. Uh, it has some of the issues that are related to its colonial legacies and its lack of infrastructure. But it actually then has the other challenge, which is immense natural resources that end up becoming a whole different challenge um, in, that, in that context. And so that is where we've been historically. But if I were to talk a little bit about ambition, um, I gave in my remarks the notion of Congress creating us. Uh, and they very specifically did not call us the US Sub-Saharan African Foundation. And so one of the ideas that I had uh, is that we ought to break out of that kind of designation anyway. Uh, I've never met a person who called themselves a Sub-Saharan African, right? That we should view the continent as a continent, as it views itself. And so we will begin to have conversations about working uh, in other parts of the continent um, as well. In terms of the countries, it has been cyclical. So we're in 21 countries uh, right now. We've been in upward of 30 plus uh, in our history. Uh, and it depends on a couple of different things. But one of the most important ones, Jennifer, is we have a model in which we try to partner with governments to co-fund development initiatives. And one of the reasons why is one, it creates a direct partnership uh, that acknowledges uh, not only the sovereignty and the agency of the, of the governments in which we work, but also their ability uh, to take on these initiatives uh, of themselves. Two, it allows the USADF to leverage the US taxpayer dollar. Uh, three, it allows the African government to do the same. And so often we're talking to members of the African diplomatic corps or folks on the ground in country, and they're saying, hey, we want to do a $2 million program for women and youth in renewable energy. That is an opportunity where the US ADF would say, ah, that's fantastic. We were looking at doing something similar. Why don't we match your $200, $2 million, excuse me. And now this is a $4 million a year program. And then if you take that out over five years, now we're talking about a $20 million program for women and youth uh, in a specific sector. So that's another one of the ways uh, that we select uh, the countries. Uh, the third, I think, is generally what you would expect um, in, in, in Washington, and that is looking at the countries uh, where the U.S. might have the greatest interest, uh, where there's mutual benefit between the United States uh, and, and that particular country, uh, sometimes where we already have strong relationships, others where we may want to build and strengthen uh, relationships. And so those are some of the key ways that we think about uh, the countries where we work. And then within those countries, the region in which we work might be based on the fact that this is basically the place where the paved road stops. These are the rural areas. These are the forgotten uh, territories. These are the people uh, who have been ignored. So that's where we try uh, to target the resources that we have fits into the founding of the USADF, which is also to just um, uh, widen the interface uh, between Americans and Americans um, as well. Um, I, I think of it as kind of a, a venture capital endeavor, not huge, chunky grants, but lots of small grants, some of which are going to be successful, some of them may be less successful, but without the bureaucracy and without the uh, massive reporting requirements of USAID, which would over, overwhelm most kind of local NGOs, uh, the smaller ones at least. And 
But I wonder, I mean, you still need to be accountable and Congress requires metrics and so forth. So how do you, how do you measure that? And um, kind of what's your definition of success? Well, the first thing I would say, and, and I'm kind of arm wrestling with my colleagues sometimes about this, uh, and that is the use of the word small, right? When you start to call yourself uh, by these diminutive uh, names, for instance, I would never allow someone to call me a minority. I would I don't let people call me short just because they're taller <laughs> than me, right? And Point so, taken. <laughs> and, but 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 I say that though know, because first to use those kind of terminology, you have to be comparing yourself to somebody else, and it's very difficult to talk about the uniqueness of yourself if it's only in comparison um, to others. The second thing is though, Jennifer, if you go out into these far-flung areas where people are getting 50, 60, 70, 100, 200, $250,000, ask them if they make it small. I guarantee you they're going to say yes. They will say, this is a God center. This is what we hear everywhere we go. And so I try to focus on our impact rather than what our input is until we can increase um, that, that, that input. Um, the other thing that I would say is that we have essentially an annual portfolio review where we're looking at the performance of our grantees, where we're looking at the challenges that they have, not just simply to dump them in a category, success, failure, success, failure, mediocre, but to figure out what more do they need? Was this a bad year for rains in a particular region? Is this a country in which there was a recent coup, which is the case in many of the countries where we work. Is this a region that is taken up by conflict, right? Northern Mali, right? Is this a place where COVID has had a particularly damaging impact? And so we're always cycling back to them um, annually on a deep dive, but on a day-to-day -day basis because our staff is there with them to figure out what their challenges are and how we can help them to strengthen themselves. And, and in fact, that really is the driving force anyway. It's not just to invest in them in a one-shot deal. It's how do we help them to improve their financial management? How do we help them keep data about their own performance? How do we help them improve their own credit worthiness so that they can actually begin to walk into banks themselves and say, hey, this is who we are, this is what we've done, and this is what we'd like to borrow. And we have this track record of doing that. Uh, another part of it, uh, and I think that this plays out more on the U.S. side, is really to change the narrative about Africa and African people, right? To say that, hey, we don't actually need a, a U.S. NGO to handhold and babysit uh, these people, that they can learn how to manage funding in a way that is consistent with what the Congress requires, right? They may be able to manage it in their own context, but they have to be able to manage it for our systems, right? And to begin to demonstrate confidence uh, in that. And that is what we really are all about. And so those are some of the ways in which uh, we look at those things. Uh, and, and again, uh, Jennifer, I think the notion of success and failure is interesting here too, right? Because a piece of this is, first of all, any business venture is not guaranteed to succeed, right? They could fail, right? But we're investing in people who are trying, right? And that's what has to happen. And that's why these are grants, right? It's not as if um, you're kind of out of it, you know, but out to, to, to pastor if it doesn't work out. But we do want to track the information of why what happened happened and how we can do it better uh, and be more supportive of people uh, the next time. And sometimes they are things uh, really that are beyond our control. Great. Um, we have a big crowd. I know there's going to be lots of questions. So uh, let me turn um, to the audience. I'd ask that you introduce yourself so that Travis knows uh, behind the mask <laughs> who might be speaking. Uh, so, yes. Just wait, we're going to bring you the microphone here. <laughs> you don't have to. Good, off, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dimitri. Um, okay. 
Okay. Good afternoon, um, everyone. My name is Dimitri. Um, I'm a graduate student. I'm going to be done in May with my dual master's here. So my question of, um, for you is, you, when you present, you emphasize on the cultural context. That means you, instead of like sending expats and you um, give, um, prioritize, uh, you prioritize more nationals. That means people in the country, live in the country. Since you're doing that, how did you measure uh, success on the ground, how you see things moving around. Because one thing with um, the, uh, in the development aid world and people in the country sometimes, they don't really see things change, even um, US um, AI, um, AIT and other organizations invest, um, are investing in those countries, but they don't feel it. Yeah. When you are, their own that people understand the struggle, the people who understand um, uh, the culture, the language, how you see tank change as a success. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think part of it is, is really just what our model is and the communities in which we uh, aim to do our work. And so we are not saying we're transforming this nation, right? We are not saying this is going to become a democracy because of these inputs. And those inputs. What we're saying is this group of farmers can have a higher yield. This group of youth can get this training and more of them uh, can get jobs uh, in the fields in which uh, they have been trained. This group of women uh, can produce this many solar panels, which can serve this many people in the villages and the areas where they live. And so for us, those kinds of impacts uh, are very easy to measure, right? Either they did it or they didn't do it. And if they fell short or if they didn't meet the mark all the way, we're looking at why and how we can invest more and differently. Uh, do we need to bring in other partners? Do we need additional inputs? Do we need to visit uh, and meet with uh, state or local government uh, to move impediments, whether it's policy or regulatory things that need to change uh, to help people uh, to do that. And so I think when you have a more direct aim, uh, it's easier to verify whether you've done it or not. But if you say um, we want to take down the temperature of the planet Earth by one degree, right, that's a lot harder to figure out what you're going to be doing, how you're going to be measuring whether or not um, it's working. Uh, but what we're trying to do is turn things down a degree or so uh, in a very much uh, more compact and compound, excuse me, compound. Uh, context. Oh, lots of questions. Could you do a couple of them? Sure, let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. I'm, I'm going to take the lady to the post and then the gentleman. Okay, so much. Um, I just really wanted. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm a senior at Elliott, graduating uh, with a BA in International Affairs, concentration in global public health in 14 days. Right. Um, and just from more of like a global public health perspective, I want to know more specifics about how COVID has really impacted your grants that you're putting out and specifically with the plethora of other issues that come from a global pandemic and its impacts on um, small communities and big cities and everywhere all over the continent. Um, I just wanted to know how that's really impacting uh, the assistance that you're granting and how has it shifted to address the public health needs and furthermore, the you know problems that really offset from that. Great, excellent question, Hannah. Uh, the gentleman right in front of you. Hello, <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, I didn't go to GW, I went to Oxford, so, but I'm glad we're here. Um, quick question. Um, just a small story. So I'm uh, born in Lagos, Nigeria, raised in England. My father's a politician. Luckily, I travel around the world. I was in Beijing in 1983. There was more bicycles than cars. And I've been in Singapore. You know, and I've seen Asia go ahead. And I've seen Africa stay behind. We drew so much money 
Oh, by the way, so I am a lobbyist. I am a managing partner with Martin Montague York, and lobby Congress and African issues. We throw so much money in Africa, so much money. And I was speaking to a certain politician in Nigeria, and he says, we don't have infrastructure. No, much, no matter how much money you throw in here, nothing is going to change. Um, you know, the markets are closed. And which makes sense because for the past 40, 60 years, we've done the same thing over and over again. And Africa is still where it was in 1975. The Chinese have gone forward. So my question to you is, I'm not sure this is something you're doing, but what are you working with African governments to ensure that when you pull back, the African governments can come in there and do something? Because eventually we have to leave. We can't be there forever and ever and ever. And so that's a key question. What is the organization doing to ensure that when we leave, it's sustainable and African governments can man up or woman up and get things done there? Sure. I don't more want more them to stack more, up too more, much. One more is fine. I think I can do it. I think we have some people. I don't want to forget. I'm oh, left handed, oh, so sorry. I don't want yes, to yes. keep them on my left. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you very much for being here. My name is Vanessa Duvalet. I am a first year, I'm oh, fine. I'm a first year graduate student. Oh, that's fine then. My bad. Um, and my question is just very simple. Um, since you became president and CEO, right, what lessons have you learned in terms of the program implementation? And what have you seen that needs to change? Excellent, excellent. Do we have COVID? Uh, oh, do we want to take yeah, three is good. Three is good. Three is good. That's my, that's my limit. Thank you, guys. Um, in terms of, of COVID, what I would say is that um, Hannah, right? Yeah. Okay, Hannah. My teaching skills. I remember names. Um, what I would say is that one of the pluses uh, of the approach we take in terms of COVID is that we actually have not seen um, a tremendous amount of turmoil in the way that the programming is run, in the way that folks are investing. Because again, they are in the country where they live. Now, our oversight, we can still do through Zoom and other things of that nature. Uh, but we just recently begun, uh, again, our travel to the continent um, after two years. And so essentially what I'm looking at right now is how have people uh, been in, uh, impacted by uh, the pandemic? Obviously, there has been a kind of general economic uh, turn down in many of the countries where we work some of that due to tourism and other kinds of things that have simply gone off uh, to the wayside uh, in the midst of, of the pandemic. But one of the key areas of focus for me is what we can do in what I want to call the, the post-COVID context, uh, even though I'm shy to use the term post uh, with the pandemic just because of the to and fro uh, of what we uh, have been experiencing. But really for me, those are a couple of simple questions. One, how have people been impacted? Two, what can we do for people whose enterprises may have been sidetracked uh, by COVID or lost altogether by COVID or not able to even start uh, because of COVID? Because of course there's people that we've invested in uh, over the course of the last two years who have had those challenges. And one of my key priorities, uh, again, I'm just coming into my second uh, 100 days now is what we can do uh, about what we find in those places. But on the trip that I just took uh, to Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire, uh, we really did not see um, people who had been immensely impacted uh, by the pandemic in terms of their own individual uh, enterprises, their own individual products that they are creating um, and distributing. Uh, in terms of kind of, you know, when do we leave? And sustainability, I think that's a question that's not really for the model uh, that the US ADF uh, uses, right? Because there is no we, the we is that, quote unquote, right? Because our people are the people who live um, in those countries. And so they uh, will be there. Additionally, when you're making investments, you're not necessarily looking at sustainability, right? An investment is to help a small or medium enterprise get to the next level of their growth, get to a place where they grow beyond the, um, the realm in which US ADF um, invests, right? That perhaps they can be bumped up uh, to the DFC or to other uh, investment entities that the US government has 
or that their institutional strength uh, and their credit worthiness is such that they are now going out and getting their own loans and doing their own thing. And so we don't really deal in sustainability in the same way uh, that other kinds of development programs uh, might do that. Uh, in terms of lessons learned uh, about programs, I think, um, Vanessa, right? Yes. I think I, I would say that uh, a couple of things. One is the observation I made when I gave my opening remarks that either they love us or they don't know um, who we are. Two, though, I think especially having traveled now to the continent for my first time, uh, is the way that we are received by African governments, uh, that we are received by local partners, uh, the quality and the strength of these relationships, uh, the way that when we show up, people begin to really understand, oh, wait a minute, okay, I, the, the local kind of ownership of what we're doing uh, and the way that our partners can kind of navigate um, be kind of national and subnational and local governments uh, to ensure that what we're trying to do uh, is successful. Uh, and I think I would say the third thing, Vanessa, is really the hunger uh, from the African diplomatic corps, uh, from our partners across the continent to be engaged in this way, a way that respects them, a way that seeks mutual benefit, a way that asks them what should be done rather than tells them what to do, a, a way that seeks to support them rather than to say we have come to save you. Uh, and I think these really are the most important nuggets uh, that I've been able to distill in that first 100 days that we discussed. One more question. Mm -hmm. No, we got this. We got this. I'm going to go to the dean. <laughs> Thank you, Max. So, I wonder if you could just follow up a little bit on what you just said that there might be a project that could scale up and might be right to for something that the USDSC could finance. Can you help us understand where what might be an ADF kind of an engagement? what might be something that's appropriate for the Millennium Challenge Corporation? Where would DSC step in? What would be a TDA kind of, help us understand the role in the U.S. interagency too. Sure, sure, I'll speak to it as much as I can. Um, I think that rather than use the word small, I like to say early stage, right? So the earlier stage of enterprises is where U.S. ADF it's primarily focused, right? To get people, not startups, but people that just need that initial boost uh, to be able to increase their revenues, increase their access, uh, increase their production. Now, to give you an example, and I think we were gonna talk about this as well, we just started a, an African Small Business Accelerator program with the DFC, right? So this is a partnership between US ADF and DFC. And in that partnership, essentially, it's a blended finance model. And so it has loans and it has grants. And essentially the money that um, USADF puts in would be grants, but those grants help to de-risk the loans uh, that the DFC is going to input. And then what makes this mutually beneficial is that it opens up to the DFC a size of business or enterprise that usually they don't engage in because they don't really have necessarily the capacity to vet down at that early stage of development. And then what it provides for US ADF is that we do specialize in vetting enterprises at that early stage level, but now by partnering with the DFC, instead of only being able to provide $250,000, now we can provide between 100,000 and a million dollars. And so these are some of the ways in which cross-pollinating uh, and partnering helps us really to grow uh, African enterprises to higher levels beyond what we can do uh, only ourselves. Uh, and what it also does is it creates a stronger uh, relationship in the interagency so that even though uh, this partnership that I'm talking about now is only a pilot, right? We're only looking at four countries, we're only looking at three to five entities a year, but we do have now an open line of communication with DFC to say, hey, you know, there's a partner that we have from five years ago who now is in this position and all they need is this kind of lift. And if you could look at them, perhaps you can uh, begin to support them 
um, in a better way. And so another goal that I have is to ensure uh, that USADF stays on Professor Cook's chart uh, for her <laughs> students each year, and that you guys begin to see year after year more ways in which uh, we are engaged uh, just like this. Jennifer, can we take one back here and then do you want to take a couple at a time yes. again? Sure. Sorry. Thank you very much. My name is Matsilla Matsilla, and I'm a Fulbright scholar from the Kingdom of Lesotho. Fortunately, I'm not studying at GW. Um, my question is on the areas of focus. You mentioned that you're most focused in agriculture and food security. I was just wondering whether you could share with us whether you have any plans uh, related to education, and if so, which areas you see as the key areas of development. I ask that because I've benefited greatly from being a guest of America in education, and I think it's one of the key areas that can play a really great role outside of just vocational areas. Thank you very much. Sure. No, thank you for the question. Uh, for us, the vocational education is the extent to which we will be focused uh, on education. Uh, obviously, it is a critical element, just like health uh, and refugee assistance and other things. It's just not one of the areas that we were intended uh, primarily to focus on. So again, it's agriculture and food security and resilience, also renewable energy, also livelihoods. Uh, and employment. And so the extent uh, of education for us at this time really is in vocational, leading directly into what we hope uh, will be successful uh, and sustainable livelihoods for people. Um, I'm going to go to the way back. Way back. Hello, everyone. I hope your trip in Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire were very nice. Wonderful. My name is Bakari. Okay. My name is Bakari. I'm a senior at the CIS, the engineering school. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to ask an engineering question. Take an outcome. I have two questions. Uh, however, I'd like to give a little bit of background if you allow me. On January 1st, uh, recently, uh, the, the AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, uh, I believe it's Ethiopia, Guinea, and Senegal lost their status. Uh, especially Mali and Guinea lost their status for unconstitutional uh, government change. So my, my first question is that uh, in in uh, in case uh, where the U.S. government were to take economic sanctions against country like those uh, with the agency like yours, USADF. Or USA or the Millennium Challenge, for that matter, uh, would they follow the US government and stop their project in those countries? Uh, this kind of leads to my second question, where uh, we, we uh, from scholars, we learned that one of the most efficient ways to fight terrorism, uh, in, uh, especially in those Sahel countries that are plagued by terrorism recently, is to fight, uh, fight unemployment but, uh, by imposing economic sanctions. Maybe if there, the response is to uh, hold the projects, they will create, create some type of unemployment. Are those uh, sanctions, economic sanctions, won't they be counterproductive in that, in that situation? So these are my questions. Thank you very much. Let's take a couple. Sure, sure. <clears throat> um, Max? Oh, sorry. Max, go ahead. Uh, good evening, I'm Max Phone and I'm with IFAS. So you mentioned tourism, and that's an area where we saw growth prior to the pandemic, a massive crash and not much growth coming back slowly, but not nearly as fast as many of us would like. Um, it's a priority for African governments. President Hassan was just here promoting tourism. Um, I'm wondering where you see the USADF in helping um, the return of large tourist volumes to Africa, in particular, I'm wondering if you could comment on tourists by the African diaspora, which is which was also growing heavily prior to COVID. Um, but it's a down couple. Um, thank you. And then the gentleman. Sorry. No. You to thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> my name is JP Bach. I'm chairman of Industry Five in Congo. Uh, uh, and um, I'm from Denmark, so um, 
I am not used to all these abbreviations that you love so much, TFC, USAIF, USAID, and I, mean, I can keep going. We call a spade a spade. But anyway, um, our first project was in Haiti. I know this is not Africa, but we built a factory after the earthquake that produced uh, laptops and computers. Uh, still exist, and we only employed women. So just to talk about that, that was a good thing. But we was heavily sponsored by USAID, the other abbreviation. And uh, USAID, uh, actually, just like you talk about, encouraged us to leave the business to our local partners, which we did. And everybody was watching, is it going down the drain now? And actually, the opposite, it went even better after we left. So. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you work with USAID and, uh, and how do you think that the, 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 the um, borders between the two organizations can move a little bit this way and that way? Because we are looking at our business in Congo right now and we are looking at USAID and TFC and <laughs> more of these abbreviations, but uh, have difficulties in, in, in exactly understanding where USADF could be helpful. Basically, we are building a factory, we are employing people, vocational, we are training them in how to build laptops, computers, and they get a certificate and they become small entrepreneurs. How, how can we work together with USADF and not only USAID, because sometimes it's difficult to see exactly um, the, dif uh, the differences. Sure, sure. I, I think I'll start uh, in the order that the questions uh, were asked. So just to talk about uh, the Goa part of this in terms of economic sanctions uh, of the countries that you mentioned, wherever, who, whichever nation, Ethiopia specifically, which lost uh, their Goa designation, uh, that is simply uh, losing access uh, to a preferential uh, trade agreement program. But those were not um, uh, sanctions, if you will, uh, that meant that all US entities pulled out uh, of that country. USAID is still working in that country. US NGOs are still working um, in that country. They have not pulled out. Uh, it just so happens that USADF is not working uh, in Ethiopia at this time. And so we didn't have uh, that issue uh, for that challenge. However, uh, I do take your question uh, as a serious marker uh, for something that might happen uh, in the future. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure uh, what the answer is specifically because our model uh, has us di uh, di investing directly. And so generally when our money is being invested, it's there already. So you can't necessarily uh, pull it back, but I will, I will bear that in mind for the future. But to answer your question specifically, in the cases that you mentioned, uh, it only uh, relied on, or excuse me, it only affected a GOA preferential, not all US foreign assistance engagement uh, in those countries. Uh, to your question, Max, it's great to, to see you and to meet you. Um, the tourism piece obviously is a big deal. Uh, I recently met with about 16 or 17 of the SADC. Uh, Southern African Development um, Community uh, ambassadors here in Washington. So there's 16 or 17 countries in Southern and East Africa. Uh, and one of the things that was brought up for Tanzania, for Namibia, uh, for Botswana, uh, was this idea uh, of tourism, was this idea of wildlife and, and this whole kind of conflict uh, between humans and animals uh, in some of these places and how that might be leveraged uh, to create um, economic um, um, opportunities. Uh, I had the opportunity, of course, also to meet uh, and to speak with President Hassan of Tanzania. We did have uh, a discussion about that. She, has, she asked me a lot uh, about what we might do for women uh, in Tanzania. And we know, of course, the Maasai Mara and all of that, uh, which is one of the things that she was here to promote. Uh, you can already see uh, a leading African nation already saying, look, one of the things we need to get back um, after this uh, pandemic period uh, is our tourism. And so these are the big drivers uh, of economic uh, growth and assistance. And if you notice, people are generally not saying we need more aid, right? People are saying we need more trade, we need more investment, we need more engagement, right? 
this is the thing that we keep hearing from African leaders uh, over and over again. And it's one of the things uh, that USADF hopes to help uh, to do. Uh, in terms of your, your question, uh, I think it's a, it's a good question. Uh, and I think it's for people to decide for themselves what it is that they're looking for from one agency versus another. I mean, we've spent an hour talking about what USADF does and focuses 100% uh, on localized uh, development, uh, investing directly uh, in African people. Uh, most of the bigger entities, specifically USAID, are generally working through uh, contractors, working through US-based NGOs to achieve uh, their ends, and, and we do it differently. However, uh, for those of you paying attention, um, the kind of popularity of um, localized development has kind of ebbed and flowed in the broader interagency, right? There was a period in which we heard Rajiv Shaw, when he was the administrator of USA, say, hey, we want to focus more on localized development. Recently, Samantha Power is saying the same thing. USA needs to focus more on localized development. And essentially what I'm saying is, I hope that they do do it. Uh, but the other thing I'm saying now that I'm sitting in this seat uh, is that there is one U.S. Uh, government agency uh, who's been focused on this for 40 years unrelentingly, uh, and that's U.S. ADF. And so uh, for us, uh, it really is about how we get support to African people and entities, uh, not necessarily how we work through uh, others. But of course, we welcome partnerships. And so, for instance, uh, when you think about USA, we are a partner with them. Uh, in terms of our grant funding that we give to uh, graduates of YALI, the Young African Leaders Initiative, also through Power Africa, where we are helping to extend the off-grid uh, support, uh, extending uh, renewable energy services out beyond the main power grids uh, in the big cities uh, across the African continent. Uh, you look at the uh, State Department, they have the African Women's uh, um, Academy for Women Entrepreneurs, I should say. Uh, and we fund many uh, of the graduates of those programs as well. And then before I close, because this may be the last question, I should say also uh, that we do have a renewed interest uh, and focus uh, on the African diaspora. Uh, we have been given uh, additional funding from Congress this year to engage uh, African diaspora communities. Uh, I take, of course, the broad meaning uh, of that term. So I'm thinking about the historical African diaspora as well uh, as the contemporary African diaspora. And you see that work in some of the organizations that we partner with. One is the African Development uh, Network. Uh, the other is the NBA Players Association, where you have both continental Africans and basketball players in the NBA of African uh, descent, both looking at how they can do programming uh, in Africa but also how they can do programming uh, for depressed communities, many of which uh, they have come from uh, right here um, in America. And so we will uh, have that and you will see that uh, coming out uh, of USADF in the years ahead. We are indeed at time. I know there are still lots of questions, but we are having a reception uh, following this. Um, so, bring your questions. Yeah, so bring <laughs> questions, line up. Um, Travis, I just want to say what a great pleasure and honor it is to have you here. Um, Travis you, uh, always inspires me when I hear him speak. Uh, I always learn something. Uh, he, it, it energizes me to kind of do more. One of the qualities that uh, Travis has is kind of a deep sensibility for inequality, injustice, social injustice. Know if you know, but in his spare time, he teaches, he still teaches at Georgetown, but teaches uh, prisoners here in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so that deep sensibility, but also this kind of uh, optimism um, that I think buoys you and buoys the people you talk to. So I, I hope you, you all come out of this feeling um, buoyed and energized. Um, and I want to just say thank you again, and thank you to the Miller family for... I'm giving us the pre- yeah. <laughs>